HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for uh, business and entrepreneurs Uh, We recently uh, found out that we're on the list of 12 business podcasts on, uh, well, it started out on allbusiness.com and then Forbes.com picked it up. So we are pretty much over the moon about that. And, uh, but we know it's because of the list, um, the listeners, of course, it's because of you, but it's also because of the guests. These are folks who have expertise in particular areas of business and they give of their time and their knowledge to have a conversation with me so that all of you can do better things in your business. Today is no exception. My guest today is Scott Miller. Scott serves as Franklin Covey's Executive Vice President of Thought Leadership. He's the host of On Leadership with Scott Miller, a weekly leadership webcast, podcast, and newsletter that features interviews with renowned business titans, authors, and experts. Scott also authors a weekly leadership column for Inc.com and is a regular contributor to Arianna Huffington's Thrive Global and the American City Business Journal. He's the Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Franklin Covey's Management Mess to Leadership Success, 30 Challenges to Become the Leader You Would Follow. Thanks so much for joining me today, Scott. 
Diane, it's my honor. Thank you for the platform. And, and I sound busier than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do, that does sound actually very busy, but you also sound very knowledgeable, which is the best part of all that. And see, you're recognized for that. So people want you to share on their platforms. It's, that, that, that's a, a huge um, confirmation uh, that you have a lot of good things to share. Well, that's gracious of you. We'll let your listeners decide that today, right? But thank you for ah, that. Right. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So speaking of them, I, I am curious what, uh, if you could share with us a couple of what you find to be the most common challenges that um, first level leaders face, if you would. Sure. I, 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 in my own words, I'd say, I think too often people are lured into leadership positions as opposed to being led. And when I, what I mean by that, Diane, is that you know, too often organizations promote, like I was promoted, highly competent individual producers, right? We, we promote the, the, the most efficient digital designer or the, the most gracious or competent dental hygienist or the top salesperson. We promote them to be leaders, the leader of the creative department, the sales leader, the leader of everybody in the dental office, when rarely is there any correlation to you being the best at anything and then becoming a leader of people. I do not think everyone should be a leader of people. I think that is bunk. And I think the leadership business, and perhaps, you know, some of us at Franklin Covey are complicit in that. I think too often we take people that are quite competent at being individual producers and very happy and fulfilled. And because we've built a culture where it's kind of compulsory, it's necessary in order for a promotion, we move them up into leader of people roles and often they implode. They're miserable. They don't enjoy having these high courage conversations or discussing the undiscussables or setting and holding their now former peers and soon to be former friends accountable. So the, so the first thing I would state is not everybody should be a leader of people. That doesn't mean that people don't have leadership capability within them, lead projects, lead initiatives, but be very cautious and careful about are you accepting the role to be a leader for the right reasons and are you clear on what that's going to require of you? I think there are some major paradigm shifts that everybody has to take place. And like me, I thought I was being promoted to be the sales leader because the company wanted me to turn everybody into my clone, which is of course yeah. preposterous, right? They wanted me to get the same results out of them but they wanted me to do it in a way that required me to work with and through other people to achieve results. So I think that's the biggest challenge is, is leadership of people right for you? And if it's not, no shame, no shame in that. Go knock it out of the park, paying my salary, right? Because that's, that's where the hard work is done is the front line. Right, right. I, I love this so much I, and it, because I could not agree with you more. I think it is such a mistake for, to, to put people in positions that are not their strong suit, that they are not comfortable with, uh, and just because they're good at one thing and expecting them to do something else. And one of the things I loved that you said was it doesn't mean that they don't have leadership skills. Like they, they might you know, lead a project or a program or an initiative so it's not that people are one thing or the other. It's where are they going to be able to be their best and contribute their best to the overall company. Yeah, well said. Can, can, I, can I add a thought to that? Sure. Because you hit it right in the head. What happens is when you promote your best digital designer and now she's over a team of eight you know, digital designers – her talent may well have been creativity and process thinking or, you know, SEO or user interface, whatever it was. Her talent and her passion or joy may not be what's required of people leaders. Then what happens is right. she then has a pit in her stomach every night because she has to come in and she has to terminate someone or she has to call someone on the carpet and she doesn't have the training or the skills or perhaps the EQ skills, right? She's got lots of other skills and now she hates her job and she quits because yeah. nobody, nobody 
hardly ever then steps down from leadership and goes back to their previous job. They go to a new company. And now you've lost not just your best digital designer, but now you've lost your new leader and everybody's worse off. So I think what's so important, Diana, and I'm belaboring this point, and I have other questions, before organizations promote people to become leaders of people, sit the person down. Say, Diane, you're crushing it on the digital team. We love you, it's so great. These are the seven things you do really well. Bam, 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 and bam. And if you were to become a leader tomorrow or next week, you would have to stop doing four of these seven things you do well, because those are not aligned with what leaders of people need to learn. You have to stop doing those, whatever they are. And you have to learn these new seven things, not overnight, but over time. These are new competencies that you probably don't have fully fleshed out right now. Man, Diane, had, if someone had done that to me, if someone had put up a chart pad, Scott, here are your seven great talents, or nine, or 12, or 30, and then X through four or five of them and said, literally tomorrow, Scott, you've got to stop doing these because either they're intimidating, or they're not replicable, or they're unique to you, or they're going to diminish people. Whatever it is, stop doing these things and start learning these things. I'll tell you, I would not have become the company's CMO I would have become the company's CEO because I lacked the knowledge, the awareness, and the maturity to understand, you know, what got me here isn't going to take them there. Yeah. I think it's a profound, you know, distinction. Boy, no kidding. Wow, thanks so much for sharing that. That, that is huge. Now, and, and you lead me to another, um, to a question about training because um, according to, researchers at um, Harvard Business Review, they found that on average people take on their first leadership role at age 30 but don't receive leadership training until they're 42. So I have so many questions about that. Why is this happening? How do we change that? What is going on? Well, I think there's not one answer, right? I think you know everybody's doing their best. No one intends to promote people and hang them out to dry. No one, no one, no one, you know, intentionally doesn't train anybody, right? Everyone's well intended for the most part. I think what's happened is is the landscape has changed. I think, you know, due to the digitization of information over the last decade plus, you're seeing the layers and levels of management collapse in organizations, right? No longer do these large yeah. companies like IBM and HP have, you know, eight, 10, 12 layers of leadership. They have four or five or six at the most. What's happening is there's massive downward pressure now where the vast majority of first level people people doing the real work, they're now reporting to first level leaders who are generally ill-equipped. So I think organizations are just trying to deal with this unbelievable fast pace of change with you know, virtual environments and, and these multi-generations. I, I don't think it's for any overt reason of neglect. I actually think that leadership as a role is become a linchpin in building great cultures, right? I mean, we know this adage, Diane, people don't quit their jobs, they quit their leaders, they quit their culture. I think there's great truth in that. And so I think you're going to see, we are seeing a resurgence of organizations deciding that leadership development is not a cost. It's an investment. That if you want to keep your people, they want to work for great leaders. Nobody goes across the street for a free soda machine or one more percent commission, or $10 more an hour, maybe they do for $10 more an hour, but not two more dollars an hour, <laughs> um, if they feel like their leader loves them. And I mean that term, you know, cultural appropriate, of course, but people don't quit leaders that they respect and care for them and have their best interest at mind. So I, I, I don't think the reason for lack of training is for anything maniacal or malicious. I think it's because companies are starting to realize that leaders are the linchpin of developing a great culture. And especially with the new generation entering the workforce where on average at the most, they may stay for three years. I'm going to guess, Diane, you and I are of similar ages. I'm 51. I don't know how old you are. Don't tell me. I'll bet you we're in the same generation. Uh, you're probably a bit younger than I am. 
But my point I'm a bit is, older than you are, well, but go ahead. Well, you wouldn't know that. But I mean, the days of people like you and I staying for decades yeah. in companies is over, right? I've been at Franklin Covey yeah. for 24 years. I'm a dinosaur, wow. and I feel young. You know, the average the average tenure now is you know two, three, four years. So if organizations yeah. want to extend that, they are going to invest more early on in the development of their leaders. Oh, for sure. Uh, for sure. And so, so part of it is about mindset, right? We have to get over this idea that because someone's good at one thing, they're naturally going to be a good leader. And we can say, okay, you're good at this, wondering if you might want to take on this additional role. Here's what that means, as you were describing before. Here's what that means. Here's what that would be about. And here's the training that we will provide to help you get there. We understand you're not going to walk in tomorrow with that skill level. Like the company has to figure that out first. Yeah, I think it's fundamental to developing leadership capability is to challenge your paradigms. You know, Dr. Covey, who's our co-founder, he authored the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This book is now in its 30th year, 30 million copies sold. And he popularized, not invented, but kind of made common nomenclature, this idea of your paradigm, your mindset, your belief system. All of us have deeply enculturated belief systems from our parents, from our junior high school principals, from our aunties, our neighbors, our siblings. And all of us have a metaphorical cataract, right? The lens through which we see ourselves, our leaders, our, the world, our competition, our company. And we wrote this book, Everyone Deserves a Great Manager, based on the premise that everyone has to change their mindsets and belief systems to better, more completely, more accurately understand what your role is. So for example, the first mindset of a leader is no longer am I responsible for just my own results. My new responsibility is in fact to get work done with and through other people. Like I mentioned before, that, that's, a, that's a brand new skill. That requires you to have diplomatic skills, to be empathetic, to listen more than you speak, to stop interrupting, to not judge people, to understand their path was different than your path, their strengths and their insecurities, their fears, their dreams and passions may be different than yours. And that great leaders understand all of that. They don't excuse it away from doing the job you were hired to do, but you bring together uh, not just a willingness to listen, but a genuine love and care for your people to help understand how to help them achieve their best potential. That sounds like a blog, but I mean it to be true because great leaders care about their people. I, I'll tell you, Diane, I, I had to confront many wrong and incomplete paradigms, and I still do. I mentioned I'm 51. I spent about seven years as Franklin Covey's chief marketing officer, first and only ever chief marketing officer. I'm still an officer in the firm, very proud to be here. And I realized in the last year, Diane, that one of my paradigms was that I needed to be the smartest person in the room. That, that because of my fear and my insecurity as a leader, subconsciously, but deliberately, I did not hire people who I thought were smarter than I, were, I was. I hired competent people, but I felt like if I went out and got the world's best digital designer, the world's expert at SEO, the world's expert at marketing automation, that they might come in and eclipse me. And I was so insecure as a leader that I hired smart people, but not people who were palpably, noticeably more talented than I was. Of course, they probably are more talented. I'm just arrogant and ignorant. But then I came to this epiphany where I realized, no, 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 Scott, that's your job. Your job is to go out and, fire and find people who are noticeably more talented than you are, bring them in, keep them in, and get out of their way. And you know what? Maybe I learned that lesson 20 years later than all of your listeners. I don't think so, but maybe I did. And now I am a much better listener because I'm also more secure in what my role is supposed to be. And I'll finish this thought on this point. I learned this from a, a new friend of mine, Liz Wiseman, who wrote a book called Multipliers. And I highly recommend this book to your listening audience. It is, in my estimation, 
the best leadership book written in the last decade. Liz Wiseman is a former senior VP at the Oracle Company. She left about a decade ago and wrote and researched this book called Multipliers. And the whole premise of the book is that as a leader, your job is not to be the genius in the room, but rather the genius maker of others. And that too often, instead of being um, the genius maker of others, we become accidental diminishers of others. And in the book, she lays out a series of about nine different traits of how we become accidental diminishers. I highly recommend it. And because I read the book Multipliers, it gave me a much better sense of self-awareness to understand my blind spots as a leader and some of the fundamental wrong and incomplete mindsets I had that were holding me back and my people back. I know it's a long answer, but I think it's a very valuable call to action for your listeners. Buy the book, oh, I do Multipliers. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I think that is huge. And, and I think so many leaders struggle with that very thing that they think, like I, I know uh, what I end up saying to people is your job as a leader is not to have all the answers. It's to convene all the resources to find the answers. That, that you know, we need someone to, to do that, but you're not expected to know everything. No one tells people that. No one told me that. And I, and I work for a leadership development firm. And I don't mean to blame my former bosses. I've had the best leaders in the world here at Franklin Covey. I just thought my job was to, the reason you promoted me was because I was a top salesperson. So I'm expert. I'm the best. I'm the bomb. And therefore, I'm going to go about on a tirade. Right. I'm going to turn everybody into me. And you can imagine how poorly that worked out early on. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, Diana, I don't know about you, but you said we're the same age. When I turned 50, I became very comfortable sharing all my messes because at this point, the gig is up. Why not just make it easier on everybody else coming up behind you, right? The, the facade is over. The kimono is open. So this is what I always say to people when they're turning 50. Once you turn 50, you just don't care anymore. It really <laughs> is liberating. I don't know what happens. You wake up in the morning and you say, okay. This is me, made it this far, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is. You know, Diane, um, this morning on my Facebook page, on my LinkedIn, I posted a quote that I found this morning. It said, be yourself. People don't have to like you, and you don't have to care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, oh, oh, wait, I got to go find it. Oh, my God. Really? I'll, email it, I'll so email it to great. you. I'll email it to Ew. you. Yeah, yeah. Ew, thank you, because I know someone who needs to read that. Okay. You know, it, does, it doesn't license you, it doesn't license bad behavior, it doesn't mean at 50, no. it just means that you become much more comfortable realizing everybody's got a mess, everybody yeah. knows your messes, just own up to them. You know, yeah. I, a, a dear friend of mine, Rebecca Hessian, once said this quote that said, you think they don't know, they do. And I love that. Everybody knows whose credit score is 820 and who's is 620. Everybody knows who's gay and who's straight and who's happy and who's sad and whose marriage is on the rocks. You know what? Just own your mess. You'll be yeah. such a better leader because when you own your mess, it gives your people permission to own theirs and then yeah. move towards success. Yeah, that's fabulous. That, that is so great. And when you were um, talking before about how, uh, you know, no one ever, ever told you this stuff. I do have to say that I was so blessed when I left college and I went to, you know, go to work. And I had a boss who would, I'd tell him what I was going to do. And he'd say, just go do it. Don't tell me about it. I trust you. And then one day we were walking to a meeting and he said to me, do you know what makes me a good manager? And I said, what, Dave? And he said, that I have people like you who know what they're doing, so I don't need to know everything. <laughs> I, I, it was just perfect. It was the best experience I could have had, it, it, you know, as a young adult going out into the business world because what – it just instilled so much confidence in me that that was his mindset. It was a great lesson to learn. You know, Diane, I think it's also easy for you and I, a little more seasoned, to, to, to have the security because there's lots of cultures where fear reigns supreme, right? Yeah, and, the, and, the young, and the younger leader is like, guys, listen, you, whatever, you've got your big 401ks and your IRAs and your podcasts, and it's easy for you to say. And there is some truth in that. 
although I'm certain your 401k is larger than mine because I have three young kids. My point is, I don't mean to be naive about the fact that there are still a lot of cultures where you have to pretend you are the genius in the room or you'll be eliminated the next budget cut. So you know what, right. there's, there's a fine line in making sure you're adding value, value that your culture rewards and needs, right? So it's not, it's not all just sit back and clear the path and cut red tape, right? You gotta do valuable work for your company. Yes, I think that is a great point. And, and I have to say, for me, one of my biggest frustrations is working with frontline people and trying to help them be better leaders when they're working for people who are not necessarily the world's best leaders. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Drop the mic. That's exactly right. It, it, it's it's a tough, it's just, you know, because they will always say to me, okay, well, how do I get my supervisor to opt on to this? And we have that conversation because if you can communicate with them in a different way, you might be able to get them to by, by explaining the reasons why you want to go down the road you want to go down. And I'm all yeah. about, you know, that sort of empowerment. But, wow, that there really are a lot. That's why this conversation, I think, is so important for the, the listeners that no matter – who you are in your organization, you are impacting other people and you don't have to know everything. You don't have to turn people into mini me's. You get to empower them to be the best they can be. Um, but I think part of it is letting go of the thing that I, I hear a lot of small business owners say, they're not going to do it the same way I do. Yeah. Right. And you're right. They're not. So what? There's no, that doesn't mean you don't set out quality standards and what success right. looks like and some guardrails and say, have at it. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But you got to let them do it their way. That's how they're going to be most. Successful. Well, and that's tough. That's tough with entrepreneurs, right? Because this is your baby. Yeah. You, you mortgaged your home. Yeah. You second mortgaged your home. You owe your in-laws $100,000 for your investment. You know, one misstep could mean you know, they lose their job, but it could be financial ruin to you. So I, I don't mean to be a Pollyanna there as well, too. I think with entrepreneurs and small business owners, it's especially more challenging to, you know, let some slack out in the rope. But if you are maniacal and you are oppressive and you hold everybody to how you would do it, oh, they'll quit you. Because no one yeah. wants, no one wants to work for a suffocating leader. So there is this delicate tension between yeah. recognizing that it needs to be done, quote, right, and your right might be different than my right. Here's where we need to end up, right? Here's the quality measures. Here's the success measures. And as a leader, the more latitude you give your people to accomplish the clearly defined success measures, the more they will stay and bring their best, most creative, hardest working talent. Says easy, does hard, but I think that's a unique challenge inside of entrepreneurial organizations. I do too, I, I absolutely. Um, Scott, I'm gonna take a quick sponsor break and then I have some more questions for you. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Management Mass to Leadership Success by our guest, Scott Miller, and The Ultimate Sale by Justin Goodbread. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. As I mentioned, today we are speaking with Scott Miller about how to be a great manager. Scott, talk to me some about why it's important to hold regular one-on-ones and um, why feedback is, is so important in today's culture. Yes, these are two topics that I am extremely passionate about, so I might riff a little bit. Um, pour yourself a hot toddy or a hot chocolate and sit back. One-on-one -on -one meetings 
are a chance for you to connect with your people. You know, Diane, there's this adage that I think is wrong, which is that leaders create engagement. Leaders do not create engagement. Leaders create the conditions for others to choose their own levels of engagement. It's, it's, it's nuanced, but it's profound. A leader's job is to create the conditions for members of your team to create or to connect or to choose their own level of engagement, high or low. So these one-on-one -on -one meetings really challenge conventional thinking. I'm going to go fast. The, this is an additional meeting to your calendar. This is not your weekly staff meeting. This is not an accountability meeting. This is not a product or project staff meeting or, or checkup meeting. This is a meeting that a member of your team organizes it. They schedule it. They lead it. They create the agenda. They do 80% of the talking. You as the leader do 20% of the talking. It's the opposite of everything you know about meetings. This is a chance for them to talk about what they're struggling with, what they're facing, what their career goals are, what their fears and passions and joys are, what it's like to work for you as a leader. Right. That's sobering. Yeah. What it's like to be in a project <laughs> with you. And so this is a chance for your individual team members to lead a meeting with you about their needs, not about your needs. This is not the time for you to give them feedback unless they ask for it. It's a time for you to clear the path, cut through the red tape, understand what's going on before they move that proverbial button on LinkedIn over to the right that says open to opportunities. Because when they've done that, you've lost them. And let me share, I think, a fairly visceral example. In most of my keynote speeches, Diane, on both books that I've co-authored, Everyone Deserves a Great Manager, and the book that I've authored, Management Mess to Leadership Success, when I'm teaching this concept around holding regular one-on-ones, and by the way, these are short meetings, 30 minutes, maybe once a week, don't overschedule them, because the worst one-on-one -on -one meeting is not the one where you talk too much, it's the one you cancel. Because the first time you cancel it, you send a very clear sign that you're not important to me. And it's easier to cancel the second one and the third one once you've set that trap. So be very judicious about how much you can accomplish and how often you should have them. But here's a point that I mentioned in all of my keynote speeches. I asked the audience, Diane, why do you think the guy three cubicles over from you is eating popcorn for lunch on Thursday? I'm going to repeat the question. Why do you think the guy three cubicles over from you is eating popcorn for lunch on Thursday? I get all kinds of answers, right? He loves popcorn. It's popcorn Thursday. Last week in Canada, he said he brought the popcorn home last night from the movie theater. I said, what? Who brings popcorn home from the movie theater? Seriously? <laughs> but apparently in Canada, it's a thing. You bring popcorn home and you recycle it. I don't know. Whatever. Love my Canadian friends. I say, no, none of those are true. The reason the guy is eating popcorn for lunch on Thursday is because payday is Friday. Uh, I knew it was because he couldn't afford lunch. <laughs> and he just put his last $3 of gas or, or $3 in his gas tank this morning. And tonight at midnight, he or she is going to the supermarket to buy Cheerios and milk because it's been a lean couple of days for their kids. And they're taking out $20 out of the ATM to pay their, their child's, you know, overdue school lunch bill. Right. And I mean that to be emotional because that surprises half of the leaders I speak to. And then I shame them and say, and if this is surprising to you, shame on you, because this is the way the majority of your people are living paycheck to paycheck. And they know exactly when that direct deposit is coming in. Everybody's got a teenage son who's vaping. Everybody's got an in-law moving into dementia. Everybody's got a bill they can't pay. And as a leader, it's not your job to own all of that. I didn't say buy their lunch, but maybe you do on occasion. But during these one-on-one -on -one meetings, it's a chance for you to connect, to get to know them. Now, every culture is different. There's boundaries, right? Some people don't like to mix their personal and professional life. That's increasingly not the case case in most companies, right? Because the fact of the matter is, if you do the math, you tend to spend more time at wake with your colleagues 
than you do awake with your family. And that may be horrifying, but it's factually true. So you might as well really like the people that you work yeah. with and that work with you. So these one-on-one -on -one meetings are a chance for you to connect and to get real. Because again, nobody quits the leader that they feel has their back, cares about them, or even loves them. That's the point of the one-on-one -on -one meeting. And if that doesn't sit well with any of your listeners, you're missing the boat. Because I have no shortage of opportunity outside of Franklin Covey, but I report to the CEO, and we fight like sons and fathers, but he has my back, and he loves me, and he cares about me, and I'm sure I frustrate him all the time, but I don't quit this company because the CEO loves me, and that, and th and that may sound goofy or whatever. I don't care. It is the truth, and I've got options, but he's very deliberate about making sure that our executive team has literally no turnover because all of us in our moments of frustration with him too, yeah. we know he cares about us and we stay. It is. I, I, well, so first of all, thank you so much for sharing that example. I think it, it absolutely gets to the point and needs to, you are so right about what is going on with people and that we are all going through stuff and we need that level of caring and I, 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 for some reason like just honesty that that the, people are experiencing things every day and the more we know about them and the more we know about how we're engaging with them and we're impacting their success and they're impacting their own success it gives us the opportunity to help them get things out of their way, no matter what it is, so that they can experience and realize their own success. You know, Diane, that's so well said. Gone are the days where there should be space between the individual producers and their leader. Your job as a leader is to lessen that space, right? Yes, you're the leader. Yes, the buck stops with you. But people want leaders they can relate to. Right? They want people that they actually yeah. can, can talk to and say, gosh, I'm struggling with this and have real conversations about, is this the right place for me? And I want a promotion, but what's holding me back? And can I tell you, Scott, you're tough to work with. I mean, which gets to your next question, which was feedback, which is one of the six critical practices for leading a team, which is the tagline of our new book, Everyone Deserves a Great Manager, is as a leader, it is incumbent upon you. It is your top responsibility to give feedback to people and help them know their blind spots. Because quite frankly, every leader before you probably pulled the chicken switch, which is why they're still behaving this way. Because everybody has blind spots and everyone needs that one leader that one leader in their career that exercises this beautiful and tough balance of consideration and courage to talk to you about what's going wrong. I mean, Diane, I've had many conversations where I've called people in and given them feedback and said, I'm going to use you as an example. Diane, I want you to know I have your best interest at heart. I can see a great career here for you at Franklin Covey. And what's said in this room stays in this room and you are exhibiting some behaviors that if they continue, Diane, they're going to result in your termination and me not being able to recommend you for a new position. So let's talk very clearly about some of these things that you're continuing to do that you may not be aware of that if you get on top of, man, you're going to rock it. And if you don't, you're going to have to rock it somewhere else. Now, that was both clear and concise and diplomatic. And then I go into very clearly what are the behaviors. Leaders must summon the courage to move outside their comfort zone and discuss the undiscussables. It is the biggest gift you will ever give your people. And the flip side is you're not just offering reinforcing and redirecting feedback to your people, which we discuss and give some examples of in our book. You're also willing to be on the receiving end of it, where you make it safe for your team members to tell you their truth about you. You notice I mentioned their truth because their truth isn't always the truth, right? As leaders, we often get no shortage of feedback. And not everybody's feedback about you is helpful. 
fact, not everybody's feedback about you is in fact about you. It might be about their ex-spouse. It might be about their former boss who looks or talks like you but isn't you, right? So as a leader, the more feedback you get, the better you are at discerning, adapting, adopting, but not deflecting and not disputing. So when someone as a leader gives you feedback, summon the courage, summon the confidence, summon the vulnerability just to write it down don't dispute it or refute it or deflect it. Just write it down. Ask some clarifying questions. Gosh, when do I do that? Or why do you think I say that? And then decide, do you value them and it enough to put it into practice? Because when leaders model the ability to graciously receive feedback, then you also make it safe for your team to receive it as well. Nice. Wow, that that is. Just I've talked so way too much. Great. I apologize. I apologize no, for all my didn't. talking. It's so don't apologize. This is what's so great about this. First of all, could could you be like any more passionate? About I'm sorry. I, I was. Yeah, I'm pretty passionate. No, I love yeah, it. Yeah, I love it. It's so great. And and I mean, it has to be said. I just love everything that you said it's true it's honest as you said it's straightforward it's succinct there's there's no ambiguity about it that's me and, and leaders <laughs> you know owe it to their people to to gather the courage to do that because it's what's in everybody's best interest i think i keep going back to that in my head which is if you believe you're doing it for the person you know to help them be better yeah then you're going to do it Diane, right? can i can i can i build on that one that thought one bit Sure. Because what one of your recaps there gave me another, I think, important nuance is I don't know about you, but we've all met the person that just kind of tells it like it is and lets the shits fall where they may yeah. and things like that, right? And and you know, I used to be that person. Me and that's too. not a, that's not always <laughs> helpful. It's not no. always helpful because you can deliver you can deliver strong news in gracious ways. You can deliver yeah. tough feedback that still leaves the other person whole, that keeps their self-esteem, their self-confidence, their self-worth intact. And that takes diplomacy. It takes consideration. It takes practice, role play, rehearsal. Great leaders who have tough things to say to their people will take the time to go down to Diane's office and say, hey, Diane, can I have 10 minutes? I've got some tough, a tough message to um, deliver to one of my team members. I'm not gonna share their name because I respect their privacy. Would you mind if I role played it? And could you watch my hand gestures, my body language, the words that I use, and give me some feedback on how you're receiving this? Because the more that you care about your person, the more you'll be aware of how difficult it might be to receive it. So you'll change your style a bit. Not so much that you obfuscate or beat around the bush or you're so evasive where they don't really get the news or the opposite, which is you're so straightforward that you actually verbally eviscerate the person, right? It's a balance yeah. of high courage and high consideration. That's the kind of leader that can give feedback that nobody else gave your people in their life as evidence by the fact that they're 50 and they're still behaving this way. Now, there's some people that have had lots of feedback and they just refuse to change. Well, then you've got some decisions to make. That's, yeah, not, right. that's not typically been my case. I've had that scenario and I've had to make tough calls, but, but, but you, you get the point. I think it's a two-way street. And if, if leaders, yeah. one of the most often questions I get on this topic, Diane, is well, how do you get the team to be better at receiving feedback? And my answer is always, have them see you getting better at receiving feedback. Yeah. That is great. Be the example. Wow. Scott, I, I love all of this information, and I have really so enjoyed this conversation. And, and uh, you know, we could do this for hours, but I know we can't. So... Will you let my listeners know, like, you know, how they can find you about Franklin Covey, uh, you know, wh how they can get your, your books, the whole nine yards, please? Yeah, th thank you for the opportunity. So I'm on almost every uh, social channel. You can follow me on Instagram, LinkedIn. 
You can visit any of our, our, our websites uh, uh, for the book titles, managementmess.com and everyone deserves a great leader.com. Like you, I host a, uh, a fairly significant leadership podcast called On Leadership. You can Google On Leadership with Scott Miller. You can register at franklincovey.com, but I'd love to have you follow me on Instagram or LinkedIn. Fabulous. Thank you so much. This is such an important topic, and boy, I, I got so much out of it, and, and, I, and, I, and I, so I know the listeners did. It's just really, it's incredibly valuable, so thank you so, so much for this. Well, Diane, thank you. I'm sorry that I talked so much, and I'm sure you had more questions to get to, but I have found sometimes that, you know, more is not better right? Better is better. So if we can get a couple of key leadership learnings that you and I have struggled with and learned the hard way, which is the story of my life, sometimes that's better than water skiing across, you know, 10 things, scuba dive on two or three, and those yeah. will transform your leadership impact. Yes, I could not agree with you more. And hey, maybe that just means that you come back and visit with me another day and we, and we have another conversation. So see, it's all good. <laughs> I'd be honored. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, and listeners, hey, um, I thank you for tuning in. This was really some incredibly valuable information for all of you. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Audible.com. To get your free trial of Audible.com and a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, Goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Pip, 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 powder donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Are you tired of the same old productivity hacks? Have you read the top 20 books on effectiveness and yet your work days and email inbox still causing anxiety, burnout, and even depression? Ready to learn the latest in brain-based modalities, techniques, and technologies to optimize your success and well-being? Welcome to the Focus to Evolve podcast, where we'll illuminate your path to spacious productivity and balanced thriving. Each week, we dive into deeply insightful and immediately impactful methods to help you become highly effective while promoting health, profitability, and well-being. Say goodbye to the trance of busyness and hello to your highest potential. It's time to discover a new way of accelerating your mission, growth, and purpose. Join us on the Focus to Evolve podcast and get ready to live your most joyful, productive, and fulfilling life.